Welcome everybody and good morning. Uh, my name is David Houston. I'm with uh, Minerals um, Energy and Groundwater Division and I'm the uh, seminar chair. First of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today in Canberra, in Hobart and elsewhere and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. This morning's speaker is Dr. Michael Roach from the Center of Ordopause and Earth Sciences at the University of Tasmania. And his presentation is on geological visualization for education, research and outreach. Geological visualizations and virtual tours have obvious applications for geoscience education and public outreach, but are also very effective methods to collate and present diverse research outcomes in intuitive spatial context. This presentation describes methods for generation of geological visualizations, outlines the resources in the OSGEO Virtual Laboratory of Australia's Geology, and Mike will provide us the uh, access for this during this talk. It will also demonstrate the potential for vir virtual geological measurements using the GeoViz 3D software and showcase how visualizations can be integrated to generate immersive virtual tool tours. A few words about the speakers. Michael Roach has been teaching geophysics and geology at the University of Tasmania for over 30 years. In the last decade or so, he has pioneered the applications of geological visualizations for earth science education and outreach. Michael created the OzGeol Virtual Library of Australia's Geology, uh, www.ausgeol.org, which is the world's largest repository of virtual geological objects. I now hand the, the chair over to Dr. Roach. Michael. Thanks, David. OK, so as Dave has indicated, what I'd like to do over the course of the next 40 minutes or so is to give you some background in geological visualizations, its capability both for education, for outreach, and also increasingly for research. So just give a, a little outline of where I hope to go to. I'm going to start initially by talking a bit about the motivation and the issues that are involved in presenting geology in a virtual sense. I'll talk about the way that we can do that via a number of different technologies, 3D photorealistic models, things called deep zoom imagery. I'll talk about the issues of viewpoints and how things like drones and 360 degree imagery help us with that. Then I'd like to showcase some online resources which are already existent, which one of which has already been mentioned, the OzGeol resource, and also the resources that are available through something called Sketchfab. I'll outline our software, which is GeoViz 3D, and then show you some of the virtual tours we've produced and finish with a summary and, if you like, some future plans about where we might like to go. So I'd like to start initially by talking about our motivation for this. I'm an educator, and so the main motivation was in how we can better educate um, new earth science graduates. And of course, Fieldstone, uh, Fieldwork is a cornerstone of geoscience education, but there are a whole heap of issues in a university environment and elsewhere that make fieldwork more difficult. The issues of distance, time, cost, and increasingly OH&S concerns means that we have to be able to augment what we do in the field, but very importantly, not replace it. And there are a few issues with this. If we simply go out and take conventional photography of geological outcrops, it's inadequate, and it's inadequate for a variety of different reasons. The first of those reasons is three-dimensional information. So if we look at a three-dimensional outcrop like this, it's really a difficult cognitive task, particularly for students and even for professional earth scientists to be able to properly analyze an, a three-dimensional object like this, even if you have photographs from multiple orientations. So the first problem is how do we get the three-dimensionality? We need to be able to depict both the geometry of an outcrop not just the images of the outcrop. And there's a couple of different ways we can do that. We've experimented with both of these, but I'm going to focus in upon one. We can use expensive laser scanners, or we can go with photogrammetry. And photogrammetry has seen a revolution in the last 10 to 15 years. So I'll talk a little bit about how we use terrestrial and other classes of photogrammetry now. 
So how do we produce photorealistic 3D models? We do so by digital photogrammetry. It starts with image capture with any old digital camera, and I'll come back to that a little later. And the thing that really makes this work is a very clever piece of, of programming which was developed in the late 1990s called the SIFT algorithm. It stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. And the SIFT algorithm enables common points between two different photographs that are taken at different scales and from different observation directions to be identified. Once those common points can be identified, then big matrix algebra takes over effectively. And in essence, you are solving a overdetermined set of um, set of linear equations to determine the camera parameters and the camera positions. And then from that, you can build a dense cloud of points in space. Now, the tr traditional way that that might have gone in, in a photogrammetric sense is to then build a digital elevation model if you were doing photogrammetry from a vertical perspective, and then maybe to take that information and produce ortho images. But if you have truly three-dimensional objects, then it's possible to generate a three-dimensional mesh, a triangulated mesh, and then to texture render that triangulated mesh such that you have a fully photorealistic three-dimensional representation of a particular outcrop or object. So how can we acquire this information? We can acquire it with any standard uncalibrated digital camera. Simply take photographs of a particular outcrop from many different orientations, and it's very important to note that you don't need to know anything about the characteristics of the camera, nor do you need to resolve the positions of the photographs at the time you take them. All of these things are resolved during the photogrammetric project, uh, process. In essence, it's magic, but it's a large amount of matrix magic effectively that does the process. <clears throat> so I'd like to now just give you a demonstration of how that occurs. Here's some initially some outcrops, some terrestrial scale photogrammetry. And this is a faulted granitic contact at Piccaninny Point in northeast Tasmania. And I'll start the video running now. And what you will be able to see is that each of those blue things represents a photograph that I've taken as I walked across the outcrop. And in the background are the points found by the SIFT algorithm. The next stage in the processing then is to infill those points to create what's called a dense cloud. And if we zoom right in on that, you'll see that this isn't a, yet a solid object or a solid virtual object. It consists of millions of individual points. The next stage in the process is to take those millions of individual points and to create a triangulated mesh of the object. So now if we zoom in on this object, you'll see that now we have a network of triangles that represents the geometry of the object. And if we display that object then in a shade of relief mode, shown here, you can see that the photogrammetry has clearly captured all of the geometry of that object very effectively. And the final stage in the process to make a truly um, properly texture rendered photogra photographically correct three dimensional outcrop is to texture render that, that three dimensional mesh. So now we have something that's geometrically correct, can be placed fully in say UTM coordinates, and which is also texturally correct. So it has the, photo the characteristics of the original outcrop. So that gives you an overview of how we go about producing photogrammetry, and I'll come back to that in a bit more detail in some circumstances a bit later. We also do this process for samples. And this is just uh, this video when I start it will illustrate that process. We take a sample, we put it in a controlled lighting environment on a computer co controlled turntable, take photographs of it from many orientations, and then we can build a fully texture rendered three dimensional representation of the sample. We've done that here at UTAS for basically our entire teaching collection from first through to third year and also for a selected range of samples from our research collections. So these are just some samples which have been scanned here at UTAS from our first year teaching collection. And you can see the level of detail that's afforded in these particular examples. We can also do this from minerals. This is an example of wolfenite from the Geoscience Australia collection and a single crystal of appetite, again, from the Geoscience Australia collection. So what you can see is that we can produce fully texture rendered models of things like this, this paleontological specimen that we could never give into, take into a practical session because our students would either steal it, scratch it or damage it. So now we can bring out some of the treasures out of our collection, including a treasure such as this, which is a vertebrate fossil from the Triassic here in Tasmania. This specimen could not really be utilized in this environment. And finally, to illustrate the level at which we can get detail, this is an example of a Permian Fenestella bryozoan 
And we've been able not only to image the texture, but also image the geometry of the surface of these very small features, which are only a fraction of a millimetre in size and only a tiny fraction of a millimetre in elevation. So we can effectively capture the texture of these objects and also their geometry very effectively with this process. The next issue that we have to encounter when we're trying to represent geology is the issue of scale. And to use a somewhat worn metaphor, we'd like to be able to see both the forest and the trees. If we stand back with our cameras, we can see the context, but we can't see the detail. If we come in close, we see the detail, but not the context. And even modern DSLR cameras, which have 50 megapixel sensors, really don't allow us to see things at multiple scales. So how can we go about getting information at multiple scales <clears throat> and get it in a single image? There is a process by which we can do this called gigapixel photography. Gigapixel photography uses a robotic camera head, one of which is shown on the left hand side. And if you have good optics on your lenses, you can capture amazing details and multiple images then can be seamlessly stitched together. We can also produce high pixel count imagery based on ortho rectification of photogrammetric models. So if you have a photogrammetric model, you can make very high resolution imagery from any particular direction looking at that model. You can get imagery with a far greater spatial resolution than the three-dimensional model itself. And on the right-hand side is a photogrammetric image of a small hand specimen, the surface of a polished hand specimen, where we've ended up with a 450 megapixel image of that, of that specimen, which is roughly equivalent to a 50 times magnification. So just as an example, here's an example of gigapixel photography taken in Chile. Note the Chilean flag. So this particular outcrop consists of a single image of 1,600 million pixels. And so everywhere in this image, we can zoom in to show the detail. Obviously, if, if viewed properly on a, on a screen, it's slightly less blurry than this because we're looking at it in a video rendition of it. But I hope that you can see by utilising a technique like this, we can not only see the context for these outcrops, but we can also see the detail of the outcrops themselves. The third issue that affects our ability to be able to represent geology in a virtual sense is the issue of viewpoint. So you would all know, of course, standing at normal standing height on an outcrop, and here again, we're at picking any point, and I'll use this example, use this location a few times to illustrate things. If you look from an oblique angle, what we can see at standing height, you see some aspects of the geology. But of course, as we all know from aerial photography, if we look from above, we can probably see things much more clearly and more clearly delineated. So on the right hand side is the same image simulated from above. So how can we do that? Of course, like everyone, we use drones and drones provide a different perspective on a geological site. No longer are we restricted to our own personal viewpoint, which enables us to be able to see much greater complexity, much greater, um, much greater information about a geological site. So what can we produce with drones? Well, we have a range of different options. We can make standard two dimensional images. We can collect high, high definition video. We can utilize the 2D images to make 3D models from which we can create, create high resolution ortho images. And we can also create 360 degree images that I'll show you a little bit later. So this video will now show the process of drone photogrammetry. And again, this is picking any point in Northeast Tasmania. This drone imagery was flown at an elevation of 10 to 15 meters above the ground. You can see that there are both images looking vertically down and obliquely on the surface, which is important to be able to resolve geological features properly. And then here is the resultant 3D model. It's no scale on this particular image, but you're looking at an outcrop perhaps 50 or 60 metres across in this location. We can come down now and look at that outcrop in more detail and come down to a height, a simulated height of maybe three metres above the surface and look at the outcrop in a, in a range of different orientations. So I hope that you can agree that this is a particularly um, useful way to be able to represent this outcrop. But as mentioned earlier, we can also take this information and generate an ortho image looking directly down. So at this location across the 60 metres of the outcrop, we have um, a pixel resolution of about 2.2 millimetres. And what that means is that we have a single image with about 600 megapixels for this particular outcrop. 
And so we can see all the details down to the point where we can see individual crystals within the granites. Now, drones are great. Drones give us information that's very high resolution, but there are limitations. With conventional drone operation, you can only work within line of sight, which limits the features you image to a few hundred metres. And also just getting to a location where you can launch your drone means that inaccessible locations are very difficult. We've recently been pioneering the work utilising helicopter photogrammetry, although this could also be done out of a conventional fixed wing. So here's a picture of our setup in a helicopter in, out on the Tasman Peninsula in Tasmania. And we've set up a system whereby we have two high resolution Nikon cameras, Z7 cameras on stabilizers, and we have the door off the helicopter and we simply fly past the landscape at a speed somewhere between 40 and 60 knots, snapping off photos every second. And then we take that information and we produce fully texture rendered three dimensional models of, of important landscape features that are too big for us to be able to image using terrestrial photography or too big for us to be able to image utilising drone-based photography. So as an example of this, this is one that was collected uh, six months or so ago. It's Federation Peak, an iconic peak in southwest Tasmania, three days walk from the nearest roadhead and somewhere where it simply wouldn't be very practical for us to do this work with a drone. Note the scale of the image here, 1.8 by 1.4 kilometres and 650 metres of relief. Yet we've been able to render the geometry and the texture of this large scale outcrop. And as I'll show you later on, we can also utilize these models for direct geological measurements. So we could go onto this model and measure the orientation of layering within the metamorphic rocks or the orientation of faults that we can visualize. Okay, so we've found that the helicopter photogrammetry approach is really effective for big scale features. And I'll show you some more of those a little later. The next viewpoint issue that we have to deal with when representing geology is the issue that a photograph taken in one direction does not tell us what's to the left, to the right or behind it. We lack context. And what we can do to get around that for the production of virtual tours is to utilize 360 degree imagery. So this is a 360 degree image fully unwrapped to make it look like a flat image. It has 360 degrees from left to right and 180 degrees from zenith to nadir points in the vertical dimension. Obviously looked at like this, they're a bit hard to visualize, but in proper 360 degree viewing software, this basically immerses you in the landscape. How can you acquire these things? We used to acquire these with the digital SLR. We had it on something called a panorama head, which is shown on the left-hand side. And we would stitch six images collected with a wide angle lens to create about 140 megapixel image. Today, you can off the shelf buy a system that creates comparable images with a single press of the button. And so we've moved to utilizing, uh, utilizing cameras like this, but as I'll illustrate in a moment, you can also produce 360 degree imagery with drones. And the basis of this is to take the drone and to take it to a given height, to hover it in a single location and then collect multiple images by rotating the drone around its, around its center point. And by about 35 images, we produce an image which has a resolution of about 250 megapixels. So here's an example of one of those. This is an example of some Methina supergroup outcrops at Bellingham in northeast Tasmania, and it's a 250 megapixel image. It was shot on a very, very dull day, so that the lighting and the colours are a bit, a bit incorrect in this location. But I hope that you can see that this provides a, an incredibly good way to represent context. So it provides us an ability in this particular case, not only to, to look in any direction that we like, but also to zoom up because this image has a large, a large enough number of pixels for us to be able to see features such as the very open, gently plunging antiform that's illustrated in this location here. And we utilize 360 degree images as the backbone of producing virtual tours. So what I'd like to outline now are some where some of these virtual resources reside so that you can go and have a look at them. And the two principal online repositories of this information from our perspective are the Osteol Library that I'll talk about in a moment, and also our, our library within the, Sketchfab, um, within the Sketchfab system. I'll also in a moment talk about our software called Geoviz 3D. So first of all, let's have a look at Osteol. The osgeol.org is the virtual library of Australia's geology. It's housed here at the University of Tasma Tasmania on a server, 
and it gives us access to localities all across Australia. So here's the Austria. I'm just playing a video now and it's at about two times real speed. So it's going to go pretty quickly. Let's suppose we want a tabular view of data and we want to see all the folds at Malacuta. These are they. If we click on one, you can see that there is attribute information, metadata associated with each of these. Click on the object and we can now see that fold at Malacuta coming up in near real time. So this, as I said, this is running at about two times real speed. The, the OSGEOL database also has a spatial interface from which we can get lots of information. We can query that to show faults. For instance, I'm now going to a location in the New England fold belt and looking at a reverse fault in a road cutting at a place called Bungwall in the New England fold belt. Let's take you now to an iconic part of Australia's geology. Let's look at Marble Bar. And so now coming in, we've got a, quite a collection of information from Marble Bar. We'll start again. There's the metadata for that particular image. This is a drone image covering the entire outcrop at Marble Bar. And it's refreshing itself now. You can see Hilux for scale in this image. And if you were seeing it on the screen, it would not look quite that furry, but um, we can also come into the individual outcrops at Marble Bar and effectively we're seeing them with the sort of resolution and the geometrical clarity that we would if we were observing these features in the field. Here again, the three and a half thousand million year old apex basalt at Mar just near Marble Bar. We can also produce high resolution images. This is a 350 megapixel image of a portion of the outcrop at Marble Bar with incredibly high resolution over a meter or so, and then all viewed again within the Osgeol platform, we have full spherical panoramas that you can zoom in on and see the features and provide context. So it's important to give both context and the detail in these models. Okay, so that's the Osgeol resource. It's sitting there. There are three and a half thousand localities around Australia that have been documented in this resource. The other place where we have our models is in Sketchfab. For those of you who haven't encountered Sketchfab, Sketchfab is the three dimensional equivalent of YouTube. It's a place where people upload their three dimensional objects for, for viewing such that they could be publicly available or potentially privately available. This video is slightly out of date. We now have just over 5,000 three dimensional objects in Sketchfab. So here we're looking at the Osgeol objects here in Sketchfab and just scrolling through some. And now we'll have a look at some in detail. They range in scale from things like this image of the entirety of the Dolphin Open Pit in King Island in Tasmania, through to the spectacular example of the angular unconformity on the seaward side of Mariah Island, which is shown just here, a scale of a couple of hundred metres across, to intermediate scale objects such as these Triassic fluvial sediments at Second Bluff near Hobart, and objects at the meter scale, ripple marks in the Rocky Cape group at Marawa in Western Tasmania. But we can also, as illustrated before, image spectacular rock samples, such as this vertebrate fossil from the Triassic in Tasmania, or the previous ore sample. And you've seen this one before, but it shows high resolution imagery of trilobite fossils we couldn't possibly allow our students to have. Some of our models are sorted into collections. So let's just go and look at one of those collections. We have a practical in third year about supergene copper mineralization. Here's one of the samples from that practical as a fully texture rendered three dimensional object. So we have, as I said, about 5,000 virtual objects in Sketchfab. The next thing I'd like to talk about is a piece of software that we've developed here at the University of Tasmania. We very early on in this process recognized that while it was great to be able to generate three dimensional renditions of geological objects, if we wanted to utilize them effectively in an educational context, we had to be able to not only look at the objects, but to be able to interact with them. So we've produced Geoviz 3D as a mechanism to interact with those three dimensional objects. And again, in a slightly speeded up version, here now is Geoviz 3D in operation. This is a folded sequence of rocks from Harvey's return in Kangaroo Island, and we'll measure the orientation of bedding. So now I'm clicking around on the object at about twice real speed, measuring the orientation of bedding and it's automatically plotting in the top right hand corner on a stereo net as you can see but i'm not only can i measure the things on the surface of the model i can measure features that transect the model such as fold axial planes as illustrated here or i might pick another linear feature like a joint 
and delineate the location of that joint and then fit a best fit plane to that joint. I can also, in this case, measure things like lineations. So here I could measure the fold axis, the fold axis and it plots immediately on the stereo net. But GeoViz 3D also gives us the opportunity to be able to annotate 3D models in three dimensions. So this annotation is fully three dimensional as shown just here. And we can also go in onto the model and for instance, add text labels. And these then float over the surface of the model. So it provides us a means to fully annotate a model. In addition, GeoViz 3D gives us the ability to measure a stratigraphic, a true thickness stratigraphic column, first by designating a reference plane as shown there, and then simply by clicking on locations and designating what the rock types are. This is basically happening here in real time. We're measuring true thickness on an outcrop which is 45 metres high. We can also, for that outcrop, we can designate grain size variation, as it is shown just here. So GeoViz 3D provides a mechanism to be able to do interactive interpretation. Here's a final interpretation, if you like, of this, of this coastal cliff exposure near Newcastle and New South Wales, showing the structural data, the bedding and the joints together with the measured section. And note that as I move on the model itself, it shows me where I am on the section on the right hand side. So we think this is a particularly powerful piece of software to be able to then take geological visualizations to another level where we can actually do real work with those. And this is where it transitions from being merely a tool for educational purposes to a tool for proper research processes. And here's just another example of a GeoViz 3D case. This is again that spectacular outcrop of the angular pre-Permian angular unconformity in eastern Tasmania. I'll put some interpretation over the top of bedding. Then we can measure planar features. We can fit a best fit curve to that. We can put on a couple of other planar features which aren't, aren't in this case cleavage, but which are simply the unconformity surface and the orientation of bedding above. And we can finally add annotation to that. So here then is an interpreted three-dimensional outcrop at a scale of a few hundred metres and done from, from visualisations created in this case by a drone. We can also do that on small scale samples. We utilise these small scale samples that we've digitised in our undergraduate teaching and Hugh, who's a student from a few years ago on the right hand side, this is his interpretation of a sample that we utilise in our third year economic geology course to study mineral power genesis. And so he was trying to make sense of the stages that have happened in this particular sample. And this is his annotated rock sample in three dimensions that he's been able to produce for this particular, for this particular rock. And we found this to be a very effective way to be able to communicate information about some of these samples. Okay, so thus far we've talked about a range of different virtual resources. We talked about three-dimensional photorealistic models. We talked about 360 degree images. We talked about high resolution images. And of course, we can also combine things like video and 360 degree video. How do we all how do we combine all of these things? We combine them together to make virtual tours. So what I'd like to illustrate for you now how we can put this information together for virtual tours, both for education, potentially for outreach, and also virtual tours for research purposes. So the first tour I'd like to show you is one we've thrown together during COVID for our undergraduates to take them to see elements of the early earth, if you like. So we take them to the East Pilbara so they can get an appreciation, although we can't physically take them there, we can do so virtually. We can take them to the seminal outcrop at North Pole of domal stromatolites, for instance, and they can look at something which we couldn't take them to, to the gorges of Karagini in the Hammersley group where we're looking at the banded iron formations and then come in and look at an outcrop of banded iron in situ and then zoom in and look at the details of this banded iron outcrop, the incredible details, including the blue asbestos you can see down the bottom, which we couldn't possibly have in a classroom environment. And finally, we can take them, of course, to the amazing outcrops at Marble Bar that you've already seen. OK, so that's an example of one virtual tour. Let's look at another. During COVID, we were forced, of course, to take our undergraduate programs online. And our first years had a local virtual tour of an area near Hobart. 
and this is an examples some examples from that virtual tour so we give them some instructions about what the rocks are designed uh, look look like so that was the permian mudstones here is the jurassic dolerite as a core stone and in, in its weathered form and then the students explore localities on the map so here now is one of the important outcrops where on the left hand side the permian is juxtaposed against the triassic in a fault zone here is the detail of the Permian rocks on the left hand side of that fault zone as a three dimensional model. And then here in the next model, the one on the right hand side there is the other Triassic sandstones, which are juxtaposed by faulting at this location. So the students can visit 40 or 50 sites very quickly and identify the rocks. And then in this, in this case, it's a sandstone. And then they produce notes as shown just here. These are taken from one of the one of the students, one of the better students, I have to admit. But this is their fact map that they generated from the virtual tour. And then this is the interpretation map that they've produced as a result of that virtual tour. So we found this a very effective mechanism to be able to teach, although since COVID has relaxed, we've got back into the field here in this locality. But this year we had torrential downpour during this field day. And so we were forced actually to resort back to utilizing this virtual tour, which is an incredibly useful resource for us to have. I'd like to now illustrate how we can take this even a step further by showing you a virtual tour that we've recently produced for the Dolphin Open Pit Tungsten Mine on King, on King Island. And um, we've got a, a wide range of different resources, some of which I can illustrate here, but later on, if we have time, I can show you this in real time. <clears throat> So in the video, we can of course go to some UAV models, starting with the entire open pit, which you've seen, but we'll just quickly zoom across again. You can see now looking to the south wall of the open pit, you can see both dikes and also stratigraphy. We have 360 degree images from all the benches in the pit where you can move from location to location. And at selected locations, here illustrated on an ortho, on an ortho image of the eastern wall, we can click on individual localities and see photorealistic versions of some of the outcrops. In this case, carbonate brezia with partial alteration of the carbonate to garnet. And for individual samples that we have at, those, this, at these localities, we've produced a range of different um, visualizations, but also we've been able to convey, in this particular case, the sample and the same sample viewed in UV light. But we've also been able to integrate with that the laboratory analyses, in this case, the MLA imagery classified with red being shear light. We've got laser maps of the shear light and the garnet together with spatially located measures of chemistry from the microprobe. So I hope that this illustrates the way that we might take research data and provide that research data in a more intuitive way that enables us to enables our research information to be placed in a proper spatial context that's a very intuitive spatial context. And if I have time after the main part of the talk, I can go back to the Dolphin Tour and illustrate it in greater detail. The second tour, uh, this, another tour that I'd like to illustrate is one for Bluestone Bay. This tour was developed during COVID for our master's program. It's a location where we'd formally taken the Master of Economic Geology program to look at magmatic hydrothermal processes it's in north, it's in eastern Tasmania. And so I'll just play this, just we'll look at a small proportion of this tour. And let's just hold on, we've just had a failure here. Let's just start that again. I'm sorry what happened, not sure exactly what happened, but hopefully now it will go. Is it going to play? Yes, it's going to play finally. Sorry about that. So now this is a locality where our students would formally have created a map showing lithology and alteration. And you can see there's a dike-like body cut by some faults with a granodiuretic ground mass, or not ground mass, a granodiuretic um, background rock, if you like. And so our students would formally have undertaken a high resolution mapping exercise here, which we then replicated utilizing um, virtual processes. So here's a full 360 image from about six meters above the ground, but we can come down to the ground and look at what it looks like from an individual locality spinning around, but we can also click on selected 3D objects of which we have about 40 on this locality and then view the 3D model. 
And when we view the 3D model, we can in this particular case see a contact, full contact with actinolite alteration on the left and K-feldspar alteration within the surrounding granite. So this was something that really saved us at the University of Tasmania during COVID because we were able to effectively take people to locations where otherwise we would not have been able to take them. And I'd just like to give you some feedback from the participants in this Master of Economic Geology program. Um, these are all industry professionals. So initially there was some scepticism among some of them as to whether the virtual tour would be effective, but we had overwhelming support from those people who participated in it. They thought it was great and they effectively said without being there, this is about the best way that we can possibly communicate the geology for this particular location. So we were quite buoyed by this this sort of feedback, which says to us that what we're doing is really an effective way to be able to communicate geology. The final thing that I'd, oh, I've got one more tour that I want to show before I go to the final thing. I've jumped ahead, ahead of myself very slightly. I'd like to show you a tour that's currently in progress looking at the, the Savage River Iron Ore. Oops, let's go back. And why did that not play? And now it's playing. Um, to look at the Savage River Iron Ore operations in Western Tasmania. So we're trying to do this for our own undergraduate students, but what we're trying to do is to show them things that we couldn't otherwise do. It's very difficult for us to take students to a drill rig these days because of OH&S restrictions. So we created a virtual rendition of it. We also have a 360 degree video, and you can hear me droning away in the background, which is me telling the students about what's actually happening during the process. You're running at multiple times real speed. We can also go to the schematic geological cross section and click on a sample. So here now is a three dimensional example of a half piece of half core of the ore from Savage River. And here is a uh, reflected light photo micrograph showing the gang pyrite and a small amount of chalcopyrite. pyrite. Here's another example of a, of a um, non ore piece of material from Savage River. And again, viewing this as a three dimensional object, but we can also integrate other facets into the virtual tour, such as the geology map from Mineral Resources Tasmania. So here is the Savage River open pit mine, and we can, this is now a fully, uh, this is a 360 degree image obtained from a drone. We have hot spots linked upon that image. Okay, I'm sorry that there was a bit of noise coming across there, but it does give you the sense, I hope, with the noise in the background, that we can convey not just the visual aspects of these operations, but also the audio audible aspects of these operations. So let's just go onwards. The last thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that thus far I've talked about individual objects and I've talked about how we integrate them into virtual tours that play through an internet browser. But the objects that we create also can be integrated very effectively into GIS. And as you can see on the screen, this is QGIS. And I'd like to illustrate this from the perspective of a couple of different applications. The first is an application in regolith geology that we produced in conjunction with our soil scientists. This is for a location near Hobart. And at each of these locations shown in little red boxes, we have three dimensional objects. And those objects are soil pits. And so now we can go down into the soil pits with annotated information for each of those localities. And at each of those, at many locations as well, to give us context, we have 360 degree panoramas. And so now if we go to the same location, we can set that soil pit into the context of the local geomorphology very, very effectively and very intuitively. 
OK, the second example is an example from our recent helicopter work showing some models on the Tasman Peninsula superimposed over the one to 250,000 geological map. I'll take you initially to Tasman Island and Tasman Island has 250 metre high Jurassic Dolerite cliffs. You can see the lighthouse on the top of the on the top of the cliff. Next, take you to Pirates Bay. And at Pirates Bay, we can look at the Permian Glacier Marine sediments. This image of Pirates Bay was collected from the helicopter in just over one minute. So the data acquisition here consisted of about 120 photographs collected in one minute of helicopter time. And finally, take you to the seminal outcrops at Cape Serville on the east coast of Tasmania, where the layered rocks of the Tasmania Basin overlie granitic basement and are then cross-cut by intruded Jurassic dolerite. This is something which we cannot take students to see this in this way because we can't get to these sort of viewpoints very effectively. And it's something that's not very well portrayed in the existing geological map. So these sort of visualizations provide a way to extend the functionality and extend the usefulness of geological mapping. And let's go down. So now to finish, I'd just like to provide a bit of a summary. I've talked to you about a range of different visualizations ranging from 3D photorealistic models to 360 degree visualizations. And in general, these are pretty easy to create. Clearly, there's a level of skill involved in getting them and making good visualizations. But I would argue that these are far more immersive and also interactive than conventional photography of geological outcrops. A few comments. The 3D models in particular are really great for geometry and texture, but they're much less effective for mineralogy. We can't scratch a 3D model, virtual model. We can't put it in our hand and assess the density of that model. So there are limitations that we've encountered in our process of using these for education. There are a range of different existing open access virtual resources that I've talked about, of which the principal ones are the Osgeol Library and also our Library of Objects on Sketchfab. We've produced software called GeoViz 3D that allows both qualitative and also importantly, quantitative interpretation of 3D models. This takes viewing these models to a next level. It takes, it gives us the ability to do real work on these models. And finally, we can integrate these geological visualizations together with a wide range of other geological information, be they maps or geophysical images to produce a range of different virtual tours for education and outreach purposes and to more effectively communicate research outcomes, as was the case in the case of, say, the dolphin um, open pit example that I illustrated earlier. I'd just like to finish then with a bit of a, a bit of a thought about where we'd like to go into the future with this. I'd really like to be able to update and add new content into the Osgeol virtual library to increase its geographical spread and also very importantly to add type localities. You know, Geoscience Australia maintains a stratigraphic database which talks about the individual elements of Australia's geology, but some of those type localities should really be captured. And it'd be very important, I think, to integrate that with other national databases. <clears throat> We'd also like to digitise significant samples, which are really the geological treasures that are housed within collections. We've done that to some extent from our own collection, but we would like, and I think it would be appropriate to do that from other collections, such as the collections of Geoscience Australia, which amount to a couple of million items, to the collections in state surveys, which includes also core libraries, and also the collections that are in museums. The museum specimens, particularly of things like paleontological specimens, are things we would like to be able to bring for public outreach. We'd like to be able to bring them into our teaching environments, and also, once they're digitised, they're more effectively utilised from the perspective of research purposes. We'd also like in the future to increase the functionality of our GeoViz 3D software. We have a whole heap of ideas about things that it could do if we had the resources to be able to continue development of that software. I think personally it's important for us to document Australia's mineral systems. And in the same way that we're doing this for Savage River from exploration right through to rehabilitation and everything in between. And it's really important as a nation that that relies for its export income upon its minerals and also its um, its energy systems to be able to document them effectively and portray them effectively. At the moment, most of the resources that we have produced have been dedicated towards undergraduate education. 
It's only a small step to take some of these outputs and to produce them in forms using different language such that they are more effective for public outreach about geology. So lots of things to do. What I need, because I'm largely a lone operator in this, is I need to have time to do it and also some resources, but hopefully those things might both come about into the future. So I'd like to finish there and um, I'll stop sharing the screen or I'll leave, actually I'll leave the screen shared, but I'd happily invite any questions about what I've talked about today and I seem to have finished exactly on time, which is amazing. <laughs>